In this lecture, I'll be talking about Philo of Alexandria, who lived from approximately 20 BC to around about AD 50, and so was a contemporary for the early period, the early Julio-Claudian period. He's born within the reign of Augustus, and he lived well into the reign, well, he lived into the reign of Claudius. Uh, of interest to us are two works that he wrote, uh, one in particular called the In Flaccum, which tells us about one of the governors of Egypt, a guy called Avilius Flaccus, who uh, was in situ in Egypt from 32 to 38. And so he covers the end of the reign of Tiberius and into the reign of Gaius. Um, Flaccus's work is a very one-sided appraisal of the way that Flaccus dealt with a riot that occurred in Alexandria in 38. So Philo is one of the most renowned uh, philosophers of the ancient world. He's very, very well known in Christian circles. He crosses the divide between Jewish philosophy and Greek philosophy. And uh, he's, he, pub he wrote many, many works and many of these survived perhaps because uh, they were kept in Alexandria. But Philo himself was almost certainly a Roman citizen, as we know his uh, nephew was. His nephew became a governor of, of um, Judea. And uh, he has a brother, Alexander, who's called the Alabarch of um, Alexandria. He's a go-between between, between the governor and the Jewish community. So he, these are high ranking men. Uh, it seems Alexander is very, very wealthy. Josephus lets us know that. And these uh, Philo is so renowned that he is chosen by the Jews to lead an embassy to the Emperor Gaius, which he did probably in AD 40. And, um, and he wrote, wrote up this particular episode in a work called The Embassy to Gaius or the Legation. So these are two works that tell us very much about the functioning of Roman imperialism in this period. And I'm going to look at Philo's works, particularly the In Flaccum, and also Claudius's letter, uh, written uh, around about this same period in AD 41, which deals with very much the same material. So Philo uh, is, uh, as I said, seems to have been born in Alexandria, but we know that he spent some time in Jerusalem at the temple. And so he's um, certainly a very prominent uh, Jewish individual. And he also spent time in, uh, almost certainly spent time in um, Antioch, where there was a very large Jewish community as well. So presumably he and his brother traveled widely and we're not certain where they got their money from, but, um, and Philo doesn't tell us, but presumably they were landed uh, men. So this is usually where people get their money from. So um, what we need to look at now a little bit is the status of Flaccus. And I think this is shown to us a little bit by the geopolitical situation that existed at the end of the reign of Tiberius. And what we know is that Artabanus, the king of Parthia, had been spreading his wings and threatening the Romans. And in fact, his son had invaded Armenia and taken it over. And he was threatening to invade Syria. And uh, Tiberius took this very, very seriously so seriously that he seems to have concocted a very complex plan to unseat the Parthian king, Artabanus, and replace him with a Roman nominee. And this involved getting the kings of the Caucasus to invade Armenia, to draw the Parthians up, and at the same time to have a Roman army threaten from the flanks and there was also a fifth column inside the Parthian kingdom which wanted to get rid of Artabanus and take on a Roman nominee. So it would seem that this was a very long-term plan, perhaps put in train as early as AD 30. This seems to be the time when Artabanus started making threats towards the Romans. So Flaccus is put in position in 32. And uh, one of the things that Philo tells us, although the work is not generally flattering to Flaccus, is that um, Flaccus 
brought his army up to scratch. And we know it was, we said it's probably a, quite a small army, but in the context of needing reserves to help uh, the governor Vitellius from 34 onwards, um, it was probably a good reserve to have. And we know that Flaccus kept them trained. So I would suggest that Flaccus was um, a highly skilled military man thought of very highly by Tiberius and put into position and kept there for many years without any problems. So um, when we get to looking at um, the information that Philo gives us in particular, um, what we have is um, uh, extracts here that exemplify the criticisms that Philo makes. So the background to this, this whole attack on Flaccus is that uh, Herod Agrippa makes his way to Alexandria, allegedly sent by the Emperor Gaius, and he heads off, he's heading off towards Syria, but his presence in Alexandria causes a riot amongst the Greeks, and the Jews then respond in kind, and then it's, it turns into what Claudius tells us later becomes a war. And this war involved uh, desecration of Jewish places of worship, and it seems uh, Jews um, doing all sorts of things to the uh, Alexandrian Greeks. So Flaccus, um, Flaccus, we are told by Philo, undertook these measures to try to settle the violence, but um, Philo claims that he picked on the Jews and it was because he himself needed the support of the Alexandrian Greeks because his own position had become uh, vulnerable after the death of Tiberius in 37. So Agrippa comes to Alexandria in 38. Uh, he seems then to have moved on, but then riots ensued in Alexandria. So after some time, Flaccus declares that the Jews were the guilty party. He then confines the Jews to their homes. And when they leave their homes, they're arrested and perhaps executed. It's not quite clear whether this is just polemic. Um, then he seems to have made a targeted attack on leading members of the Jewish community. And he arrests the 38 members of the Senate. There's a, Ju a separate Jewish Senate in Alexandria. And we'll discuss this point a little bit later. And these men are held responsible for all of the doings, obviously, and some of them end up being crucified. So it's clearly a very um, aggressive move by Flaccus to settle, certainly to settle the Jews down. When he talks about the house-to-house -house searches for weapons, he focuses on um, the Romans coming to look in the houses of the Jews for weapons, but he does mention in passing that the Romans had some time before looked in the houses of the Egyptians. And so even though all of these things, they're, they're being told from a Jewish perspective only, it's possible that Flaccus was doing the same to the Alexandrian Greeks. Um, uh, but because we have only Philo's impression of what was going on, we're not quite sure of, uh, you know, whether or not Flaccus was being even handed and, and treating the Greeks with the same sort of disdain. Um, it's possible that he, have, that he isn't treating the Alexandrian Greeks with the same disdain because they hold citizenship of Alexandria, whereas we, we learn repeatedly that the Jews are excluded from citizenship of Alexandria. So that's, these are just a few things. And I've just picked these up because they seem to be um, um, actions taken by the governor, which um, Philo says are biased and prejudiced and nasty, but he doesn't actually say we're illegal. So when we get to uh, the other bit of contemporary evidence that we have, the letter of Claudius to the Alexandrians, this was written around about AD 41. And uh, it was put up by the governor of Egypt. At this time, Aemilius Rectus, we know that um, Flaccus had been removed from his position probably towards the end of 38. There may have been an interim governor 
um, the man who's nominated below as a, a procurator, and this is Polio, um, but um, there, there may have been ongoing violence as well in the city, ongoing rioting between the removal of Flaccus and the installation of the new governor, and we're not sure when he actually came into power. So in this, there seems to have been two embassies that went to visit Claudius, the emperor, and perhaps to congratulate him on becoming emperor, which he did in early 41. And also from the Alexandrian perspective, he's offered a number of honours and he discusses these honours and he responds very kindly to these honours. So further on in the letter, um, we have uh, a request by the Alexandrians to set up their own Senate. And this is an interesting proposal because, as I mentioned with the Jews, they had their own Senate. And it was this Senate that Flaccus arrested, apparently, uh, for, no, for no reason, according to Philo. Um, but it's possible that this, they weren't allowed to have a Senate. And in fact, Claudius tells us in this letter that the Alexandrians never had a Senate. And perhaps it was illegal for them to have any sort of Senate. We don't know. All right, so then he comes to discuss the rioting. And I think this probably refers to the events of 38, although other commentators believe that rioting must have continued on and, and perhaps uh, there was more rioting after the removal of Flaccus. Anyway, he calls it the rioting or really the war with the Jews. So this is the Alexandrians and the Alexandrian Greeks and the Jews are at loggerheads. He says he's not going to make an inquiry as to who was responsible. He doesn't care. And all he says is, I want you to put a stop to this right away. And he then specifies the Alexandrians need to show themselves accepting of the Jews who've lived for many years in the same city, allow them to practice their rights and customs. So this uh, is something that Philo does pick up that the Greeks had prevented the Jews and, and in fact had desecrated their synagogues. On the other hand, he explicitly orders the Jews not to agitate for more privileges and not to send a separate embassy as though they lived in a separate city. And so what Claudius is doing here is denying the Jews' request to have citizenship of Alexandria and the Jews were excluded from citizenship because the Greeks controlled the process by which one became a citizen and the, um, the rules and uh, sort of customs were not compatible with, with Jewish religious beliefs. So the Jews sort of self-excluded from, from um, Alexandrian citizenship, but certainly the Greeks didn't want them anyway. So the other thing that he says is they are not to force their way into any of the games. And so this is something that Philo hasn't mentioned, that the Jews retaliated in this way. And he tells the Jews that they should be grateful for the advantages that they have since then they're in a city not their own. So again, he's explicitly excluding them from citizenship and he's telling them not to bring in or admit Jews who come down the river from Egypt or from Syria, so from Judea, effectively. And he goes on to say he will be very angry if they do this. So clearly um, the, the Jews had been coming into Alexandria in quite large numbers, and he didn't want that to continue. All right, so this brings us now to the nature of what the speech against Flaccus represents. And if we compare it, I think with a very good comparison is Cicero's speeches against Verres. And uh, in 70 BC, uh, Cicero prosecuted Verres for uh, extortion in the province of Sicily. And he became the patron of the Sicilians to do this. So the Sicilians went to Cicero, they asked him to prosecute Verres and Cicero could do this. Um, but when we read through the um, against the speech against the, all of the speeches against Verres, we see very, very similar claims about the use of excessive force. 
Um, but one of the things that is clear from Cicero's speech, it's not illegal. Anything that Verres does in this way, the only time it becomes illegal is when he puts his finger in the pie and starts stealing money. And this is the reason he's, he's on trial for extorting money from the Sicilians in an illegal way under legislation that was set up during the Republic to defend provincials from rapacious governors. So Verres, uh, Cicero tells us he, he did almost the same thing as, as Philo. He killed people, he restricted them to a house, he was engaging in rape and pillage all over the place. But in the end, it's because of financial irregularities that he is uh, forced into exile and then found guilty. And if you want to have a, a quick review of the whole of this um, attack on Verres, have a look at Plutarch's Life of Cicero. He discusses that and he says how happy the Sicilians were to have Cicero win the case for them, to prove their point, to defend their interests, and also to air all the wrongs that had been done. Okay, so this brings us back to the limits of, of complaint that the Jews of Alexandria had. And I think this explains why Philo wrote this work in the end. And this really comes down to uh, a big change that has occurred between the Republic and the Empire. And this is how certain of the, the areas, the provincial areas, were being run. And the first one goes to how Flaccus was appointed. So Philo tells us Flaccus was chosen by Tiberius Caesar as one of his intimate companions after the death of the previous governor. Uh, he was made governor in Egypt, viceroy of Alexandria in the country roundabout. So although I've suggested that Flaccus must have been a, high, a military man of high quality, He's chosen primarily because he's close to the Emperor Tiberius. And Flaccus is outside the senatorial structure. He seems to be a very wealthy man. We know after he's condemned by Gaius that his property was sequestered, and there seems to have been a lot of it. He's a very wealthy man of equestrian status, and he perhaps came into the circle of Tiberius through various means, which I'll, I'll have a look at in a minute. Um, but he's chosen because he's a close friend of Tiberius. Then we have an alleged speech made by Flaccus himself. He was born, brought up and educated in Rome, and he's the schoolfellow and companion of the offspring of the daughter of Augustus. So presumably it was Augustus who chose Flaccus, or perhaps Julia, who chose Flaccus to be companions to um, perhaps Gaius and Lucius and maybe some of the others who were involved, um, but they were specially uh, selected by, he specially selected by Tiberius Caesar as one of his most intimate friends. And so we have, again, it's simply relationship to the emperor, you're an amicus principis, and then you can be chosen to be the governor of Egypt. Um, this relationship with Tiberius seems to have been quite genuine because we have um, Philo admitting that Flaccus was overwhelmed with the most heavy grief because of Tiberius and he grieved exceedingly as if for a near relation and he was continually depressed and weeping incessantly. And I think this shows that there was uh, a very close relationship. So once Tiberius died, Flaccus um, has to work out an, a new relationship with Gaius. And presumably, if he had been in the circle of Tiberius, he had also known Gaius quite well, even though he left Rome perhaps in 32. Uh, Gaius at that time was, um, so he's about 20. And so Flaccus would have known Gaius as a man. Um, Philo tries to make a case that Flaccus was in trouble because he, he favoured the cause of Tiberius Gemellus, um, who ends up being a Gaius sees him as a rival and eliminates him, and therefore Flaccus um, becomes persona non grata to Gaius. Um, but it's not clear that this was the case, particularly if um, this is true his relationship would have been with 
um, the mother of Gaius, Agrippina the Elder. So she's one of the offspring of the daughter of Augustus. And Flaccus was obviously in this circle with the five children of Julia and Agrippa. And so um, this is the other side of the family. Um, however, it's possible that, um, you know, when uh, Gaius and Lucius died, all of their friends migrated to Tiberius when he was adopted by Augustus, because this was a typical practice in, in imperial circles that the followers of one member of the imperial family would, would move to um, other members of the imperial family when, that, when their friend died. And we know this happened with uh, all of the friends of Tiberius's brother Drusus were taken on by Tiberius as his own amici. And, um, and so he cherished them as much as Drusus had. And so presumably this is the process that we're, we're seeing here. Um, however, uh, the Flaccus couldn't win over Gaius. Um, and so, you know, he found it very difficult. So he had <laughs> panegyrics and all these other things to try to win over Gaius. So what this tells us is the appointment of the governor was made by the incumbent um, emperor. He's a close friend of the uh, emperor. And this makes it very difficult for provincials to complain. How do you complain about the emperor's best friend to the emperor? Uh, what you're doing is you're criticizing the choice of the emperor. And this is why I think Ty um, Flaccus uh, really was targeted by Philo. There was no other way for Philo to, to criticize Flaccus except in a speech written or a piece of work written after Flaccus was dead and possibly after Gaius was dead as well. And so this is his way of attacking Flaccus. He does it via memory, not through any other means. So there were ways of assessing a governor's performance. And these, these are equestrian governors. Equestrian governors are usually allowed to see out their term of office. They return to Rome and then the emperors ask them <laughs> about their own accounts. And the emperors behave like impartial judges. I don't think so. And they listen to accusations and other matters that are going on. This is what Philo claims happened to Flaccus, that, um, that he was arrested. And, and, and um, Philo tells us that he was um, arrested halfway through his governorship, didn't wait until the term of his government had expired. But Flaccus had been there for, for six years already, which is quite a long term of office. And it was very common for governors to change over when there was a new emperor in Rome. And we know that, in fact, Macro had, Dio tells us that Macro, the Praetorian prefect, had been chosen by Gaius as the new governor of Egypt. And possibly Flaccus was expecting Macro to come and replace him. And perhaps Flaccus was thinking he might become the new Praetorian prefect. So this was a relatively common jump from Praetorian prefect to governor of Egypt and vice versa. So Flaccus was probably expecting good things to happen to him. And then he hears in very quick succession that Tiberius Gemellus has been killed and then Macro has been forced to commit suicide. So um, things became very difficult for Flaccus, as you can imagine. And then he was arrested. Then he was taken to Rome. And Philo tells us that two Alexandrians, Isidorus and Lampo, were part of the prosecution team. But it's not clear what he was prosecuted for. And it seems nothing to do with the events of, uh, that happened in Alexandria. Um, because as Philo mentions earlier, Flaccus had been involved in the downfall of Agrippina the Elder, the mother of Gaius, and Gaius had started picking off all of those people who had been involved in the downfall of his brothers and his mother Agrippina. And the things that happened to Flaccus, he was um, found guilty and his property was taken by Gaius personally. And this suggests that 
Flaccus uh, was viewed as, as, as a traitor to Gaius and was guilty of treason. And later Flaccus was executed. And so I think there's a, there's a fairly strong case that Flaccus was, was found guilty of treason by Gaius. So I think what we see here is a complete change in the way that, not the way that governors behave, but we have two systems in operation. We have the senatorial system, which was um, which developed during the Republic and for which laws developed during the, the, the second century BC to ensure that the provincials had some mechanism for complaining. And the other indirect method for complaining was that most of these provinces had patrons in the Senate in Rome. And so provincials could approach their, their patrons and ask them to attack any errant governors. And quite often this plays out, not so much in prosecutions for provincial maladministration, but attacks um, for other reasons. And so uh, there was sort of a, a balance in the way that governors could be brought to, um, to Brook. And, the, the patrons could uh, make an attack on them in the Senate and to say how disgusting they were in their behaviour in a province. So these men would be outed in some way during the, the Republic. When we get to the empire and particularly to these areas where the emperor puts in his own men, these are not senators, these are wealthy equestrians. Uh, and so in Egypt in particular, that man in Egypt is responsible only to the emperor. And so the emperor has to take a dislike to him for any leverage to be given to the provincials to attack this man. And so there are no natural patrons except the emperor. And so it becomes very, very difficult for these provincials during the empire to, to do anything about it. And Egypt is a case in point, but you might consider the events that took place um, at, at a similar time in um, Judea, where we have, um, you know, the trial of Jesus Christ and what rights he didn't have either. And so all, all of the patrons are the emperor, and it's very difficult for these people to get any leverage to you know, to win or to, to attack the, the incumbent governor or even after he has disappeared. So I hope this lecture has gone some way you know, to helping you understand um, that there have been shifts in the way that imperial uh, patronage has changed um, the outlook for provincials. It's not that the behaviour of governors was any different. So Flaccus behaved much as Verres did but Verres could be brought to book, book, whereas Flaccus couldn't. And that's the difference between them. So thank you very much.